The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. A short, catchy phrase which the zealot loves to quote. Unfortunately for them, these eleven little words do more to demonstrate that their God does not exist than they could possibly know. Why don't they know this? Because, as always, they quote the words without ever thinking about what they are quoting. So let us do their thinking for them. I am deliberately not piggybacking this on the debate between Matt Dillahunty and Saiton, because that would be a view-grabbing technique that is almost always beneath me, but mainly because whilst this video does address two favourite soundbite Bible quotes of Saiton's, it does not address the entire non-debate. Anyway, Saiton, like most Christian apologists, will tell you that we humans have innate knowledge of many things, including what is morally good and bad, and of course the existence of their chosen deity. So in this video I want to provide evidence that the idea of innate knowledge of this kind is unsupported, whilst also exposing certain Christians' very poor grasp of basic biology. How do we test for innate knowledge? How do we know how we know what we know that we know? That's a hard thing to figure out, not easy to say. It's not an easy task to test even a very young child in this way. Their early years are spent soaking up vast amounts of information from their surroundings. The very act of formulation of language involves the assimilation, processing and categorising of a shed load of information. So by the time a child has the communication skills required to respond to complex questions which might test the basis of their knowledge, they have already progressed far beyond a stage where we might easily determine how they came to that knowledge which they have. However, there is a circumstance under which scientists have been able to determine whether very basic knowledge is innate or has to be learned. Experiments carried out in the past few years answered a 300-year-old question on precisely this issue. I'll get back to that in a minute or two. But first back to science. The fool hath said in his heart there is no God. I've said it before, but it is worth repeating that the English language we use today has been very much influenced by the King James Bible. Generations of people learn to read and write by repeating Bible passages. It's not therefore surprising that Bible phrases and idioms passed into general English usage. I invite you to search the Bible for the word heart and you will see what I mean. Do you find it just a little odd that the scientifically accurate in every way Bible very clearly defines the human heart as the seat of emotions and understanding? Not to forget willpower, of course. The absurd excuse that God was talking in a way that primitive people would understand is in direct conflict with the claim that God had created man and been watching and guiding him from day one. Someone might throw in the free will card to obfuscate this point, but I'll be coming to that as well. God is quoted in this Every Word is True book as telling Moses that he, God, has hardened Pharaoh's heart, perverting Pharaoh's free will and preventing him from allowing the Hebrews to run away. Why would a scientifically accurate book, written by divine order and with the divine guidance of an omniscient being, continually and forcefully press the point that the heart is the seat of emotion, understanding and willpower? The answer, of course, is that the book was actually written by Bronze Age desert dwellers and reflects exactly the level of scientific knowledge that we would expect them to have had. It is not, in the real world, hard to imagine why our forebears thought as they did. Death almost always involved a loss of blood. If not, then it involved the heart stopping, and the heart was the only obvious active part of the body. A heart will carry on pumping if removed from the body, suggesting it has a life of its own, and we can feel changes in our own heart during periods of high emotion or stress. The heart is also, well, at the heart of the body, where you might expect an important organ to be. The brain, on the other hand, looks like a blob of congealed wallpaper paste and utterly inert. The ancient Egyptians believed that the heart survived death and was the seat of thought, emotion and will. The soul, if you like. For this reason, the heart was left in the body when the other internal organs, thought to be necessary in the afterlife, the lungs, stomach, liver and intestines, were removed, being preserved in individual canopic jars. The insignificant brain was liquefied and allowed to dribble out of the nose. The ancient Greeks variously divided the emotional functions of the soul between the heart and liver, with some placing the rational functions of the soul in the heart and others the brain. Plato split the soul into three parts, the rational, the spiritual 
and the appetitive appetite. Aristotle viewed the heart as the seat of intelligence, with the brain as nothing more than a heat sink, reducing hot bloodedness and making humans more rational, simply because we have the biggest heat sinks. Galen, in the second century, by operating on animals, learned much about the brain. He followed Plato's division of the soul into three parts and placed the rational in the brain, the spiritual in the heart, and the appetitive in the liver. Galen also rejected the dualism of the Stoics, who considered pneuma, the breath of life, to be present in all things and to emanate from or be a fragment of the pneuma of God. God for the Stoics, of course, being Zeus. For Galen, there was no separation between the mental and the physical. If we jump forward to the 13th century, we find Thomas Aquinas defining the soul by arguing that others had misinterpreted Aristotle's words. Why was Aquinas working from Aristotle and not the Bible? Because, of course, the word soul does not appear in the Bible. The immortal soul is very much a Christian invention. The ancient Hebrews had no concept of an immortal soul, and the idea does not appear in the Pentateuch or anywhere in the Bible prior to the Babylonian exile, where the Hebrews were exposed to Greek and Persian ideas. The Hebrew word nephesh, often translated as soul in the Old Testament, actually means living being, and comes from the root word norfash, to take breath. Nephesh was translated into the Greek Septuagint as psyche, psyche being the Greek idea of soul, as previously discussed. And it was this Greek idea of soul which was developed by the early Greek-educated Christian fathers. Once again, the believers chose to believe what was not in the Bible, as well as the bits that were in there that they liked. Bible verses which stated the soul was mortal caused problems, as did the resurrection, and so soul sleep was invented, such that the soul could rest in limbo after mortal death until the Messiah returned to resurrect it. Origen argued successfully against the idea of soul sleep in the 3rd century, just Origen, and not Saint Origen, because many of his other teachings were considered heretical. He was declared anathema in the 6th century, and never canonized, even though he died a Christian martyr. But the church was happy to support this heretic's idea on the immortal soul. So anyway, Aquinas could not find his soul in the Bible, and instead reinterpreted Aristotle's words to mean that the soul, while immortal and separate from the body, was a required part of the human whole, the material body dying, but the immortal soul continuing after death. Now I'm sure you've heard the phrase, the eye is the window to the soul. We know that early Christians, and some today who refuse to educate themselves, see the eye as a divine creation and proof of intelligent design. God created the eye to give us veridical vision, but it is also the organ which will most lead us into temptation. If thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out. The ancient Greeks, again, saw a connection between their version of the soul and human vision. Early Greek emission theory hypothesized that we see because of rays which emanate from the body and interact with the outside world. Aristotle, Galen and others argued that we see because of something representative of the object entering the eye, though Aristotle, and we only have scraps of his thoughts, elsewhere talks about visual rays which would be close to Plato's idea of an internal fire from the eye reacting with an external fire or light and somehow producing vision. Isaac Newton, devoutly religious and scientifically methodical, decided that the best way to determine what aspects of vision are due to the external eye itself and what is due to the soul or internal perception was to poke himself in the eye, which he did repeatedly with brass plates and bodkins and then documented how the eye focused images on the retina. But odd ideas of the working eye persisted. Famously, Wilhelm Kuhn pioneered the process of optography, and was responsible for the widespread idea that the last image seen before death was recorded on the retina. In 1888, Mary Jane Kelly's eyes were photographed post-mortem, in the hope that the identity of Jack the Ripper might be revealed. Having brought you to the eye via the soul, I shall now wrap this up on the topic of innate knowledge by hopefully providing you with evidence that even our most basic knowledge or understanding is something which we must learn. In the late 17th century, William Molyneux posed the following question. If a man born blind can feel the differences between shapes such as spheres and cubes, could he similarly distinguish those objects by sight if given the ability to see? 
The question probes to the heart of the matter of tabula rasa. Is the mind a clean slate, or is there some pre-programming in place? But also, do certain elements of development need to occur early on before the wiring of the brain becomes set in place? Curable congenital blindness is, unsurprisingly, cured early on in the Western world, but we humans are not all equal, and this gave Pawan Sina, a professor of vision and computational neuroscience at MIT, his opportunity to answer the Molyneux poser. Sina set up Project Prakash in 2003 to bring sight to hundreds of sinful children that God had forgotten about in India. The treatment is free and allows Sina to progress his neuroscience studies whilst helping children regardless of whether their particular condition fits his study profile. Sina found five children aged 8 to 17 totally blind from birth but with the potential to be brought back to full sightedness in a single step. He provided clear evidence that these children, clearly able to distinguish objects by touch, could not differentiate between those same objects by sight alone. And so, whilst the human brain very obviously develops with the ability to accumulate knowledge, this experiment would very much suggest that even the most basic knowledge and understanding must still be learned. Another well-known case is that of Mike May. Mike was blinded in a chemical explosion at the age of three, we think of three-year-olds as quite well-developed. They are beyond the toddler stage and fast turning into mini-me's. But Mike May's experiences provide evidence that a three-year-old's visual perception is still far from developed. Now, Mike is not your average Joe or Mike. He was the first blind CIA agent and held a world record for downhill skiing. And in 1999, at the age of 46, Mike had the vision restored in one of his eyes by a combination of cornea transplants and stem cell surgery. Being an adult American, Mike provided additional information beyond that gleaned from the experiences of the younger, impoverished Indian kids. After the operation, Mike also could not differentiate between a cube and a sphere, simply by visual cues. Three years after the operation, he could still not recognize people by their faces, and as he himself stated, two of the major clues I have are color and context. When I see an orange thing on a basketball court, I assume it's round, but I may not be really seeing the roundness of it. More significant is what science can tell us about Mike's situation. A laser interferometer is a tool used to test the retinal functions of cataract patients. The interferometer bypasses the cornea to project a pattern directly onto the retina. Patients with cataracts will still see a pattern of interference lines when this tool is used. Mike sees nothing at all. The part of his visual cortex needed for him to interpret this had simply not developed by the time he was three years old. Mike has similar problems with perspective. He learnt his world through direct touch of nearby objects and did not develop a sense of perspective. In his own words, a hallway doesn't look like it closes in at all, he says. I see the lines on either side of the path, but I don't really think of them as coming closer in the distance. He pauses to mull this over. Or maybe my mind doesn't believe what my mind is perceiving. When I see an object, it doesn't look different to me as I circle around it. I know orange cones around vehicles are cones because of context, not because I'm seeing the shape. If I picture looking down on a cone it still looks like a cone. An interesting aside is that whilst Mike does not see distance and perspective as most of us do, he can catch a ball thrown to him without a problem. This is accepted to be because the motion sensors of the brain are hardwired, part of our primitive brain, and separate from some of the other visual centers. Now, what originally prompted me to this video was the recent case of Joanne Milne, the British woman who gained her hearing at the age of 39. If you've not heard of her, then you're missing out on a heartwarming moment. The key thing to take from Joanne's experience is that she was overwhelmed by the sounds she heard, and she heard everything. Her brain had not developed the filters which we are now unconscious of, and so she was constantly distracted by extraneous sounds which her friends and family had not even consciously registered. And of course, whilst she heard all these new sounds, she had no idea what they were until she could tie them into visual cues or have them explained to her. So where does all this lead us? If in some science fiction scenario, we could create an adult human from scratch, what problems would that give us? Firstly, their brains would be adult brains. 
how would they be wired? All of the developmental stages a human goes through, which program the brain, would have been skipped. No learning process would have been undertaken, and it is the learning process which develops the child's brain into an adult brain. The only way to overcome this would be to fix the brain into a configuration of our choosing, so that the created adult could interpret the world in a way of our choosing. The created adult would have no opportunity to evaluate and register every sight and sound, and smell, and taste, and touch, etc., etc. Their fully formed and hardwired brain would not have the plasticity to develop the pathways to integrate this new information, or the other vast amounts of developmental stage information, which is why the Jesuit motto, Give me a child until he is seven, and I will give you the man, in a large part still holds true. Would we be able to claim that this Adam we had created was a truly autonomous being? Or would we rather have created a pre-programmed being, whose every thought and action resulted not from knowledge and wisdom gained through experience, but was instead predetermined by the programming which we had implemented? What then of free will? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Well, no, because only a fool or the uneducated would claim that our thoughts reside in our heart. Do we have innate knowledge of God? Evidence would suggest that the only things we have innate knowledge of are those things required for primitive survival, which we share with cats, rats and lizards. So do they share our innate divine knowledge? What do you think? Please post a comment. Let's start a discussion. And thanks, as always, for watching.